Thank you, sir. <laughs>、uh,、so, howdy.、Um, now, a while back, I read a really interesting article, so I'm going to start things a little different this morning,、um, kind of a social experiment.、Um, so, I'm going to ask everybody here to think of your three most favorite movie characters you had as a kid.、Uh, just the first three that pop in your brain,、uh, literally the people that you kind of admired as a kid. Does everybody have them? Got them in your head?、Uh, who picked this guy? Yeah, you did.、Uh, anyone? It's okay, we're in a safe place, even though we're in City Hall.、Um, but the article I read about was essentially、um, how movie characters you identify with or admire as a kid actually influence who you become as an adult. Everything from your sense of morality to how you interact socially with others. And I thought this was just fascinating because I get this question a lot.、Um, <laughs> So for me, it was a great out because、um, the conclusion I drew is it's not me, it's the media that's to blame.、Uh, because when I actually put the five movie characters that were my favorite as a kid together on one slide, it became pretty obvious what was wrong with me.、Um, and I'm sure a lot of my coworkers are really quiet here in the audience because this explains oh so much.、Um, but I thought this was a quicker way to kind of give you a, a really quick、uh, summation of who I am personally and kind of、uh, let you deduce your own. Uh, uh, outcomes on how or what my creative process is actually like.、Um, but seriously,、um, as humans, media actually affects a lot of things about us personally,、uh, our sense of self worth and importance.、Um, and this is really kind of、uh, impactful when you think about、uh, the characters that you see on screen and how you're always kind of upholding yourself to them. They kind of set this bar. So when I first started out as a designer, my wife and I used to have these discussions on. Why aren't there more TV shows about creatives and designers? They're all about doctors, lawyers, and attorneys. And my wife, who is an attorney,、uh, actually would rest her case every time with, like, no offense, honey, but、um, cops, doctors, and lawyers actually deal with life and death. A show about designers just wouldn't make good TV. Now, I'm not saying she was wrong <laughs> by any means.、Um, But as designers, I think, and creatives, we often kind of struggle to find kind of meaning or worth、um, with our profession. Because we look at some of these、uh, dramatizations of other professions,、um, and we kind of think our profession maybe isn't kind of worth as much.、Um, I mean, I used to personally think,、um, as a designer, how can I actually help people? I mean, I make a poster or a logo.、Um, and I think it's actually wrong to think like that. Design does matter. So, another question I, I get a lot is、um, how do you pick your side projects or your passion projects? Because、um, I think most everybody here has,、um, came this morning to hear about one of those,、uh, something about flying cars or something.、Um, so, to kind of answer that question, I'll give you the long answer.、Um, so, I originally moved to Austin about 10 years ago to work for this、uh, firm here in town called FT2S. And it was a great place because it actually pushed me to think outside of just being a graphic designer and thinking about being as a designer. And that's where I learned how to do rapid prototyping,、uh, actually, formal design research,、um, physical design of actual objects.、Um, and it's where I first went in a lot of deep dives on transportation and transportation research, actually, doing a lot of work for Cap Metro that you've probably seen around town. But it was also where I had this first original project that changed everything for me as a designer. So, we were asked by MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, one of the world's largest cancer centers, over 10 million square feet,、uh, to help patients get around and get to their appointments faster. So, we did a lot of hard work over a couple years, actually going in、um, and designing this, in, this entire system. And as you can imagine, a system that spans 10 million square feet, there were a lot of、uh, battles and a lot of late nights and a lot of gnashing of teeth. But in the end, we had this entire system that was in, in place in this hospital and was actually running. And, After it had been running for a while, we went back and did、um, observations just to kind of check on the system and see how it was working for patients. And that's when everything changed for me as a designer because I watched a 16 year old cancer patient walk up to a touchscreen, punch up her directions and her appointment, print out her directions, look down at the icon on it, look up on the sign, find her icon, and turn around to her parents and excitedly say, This is fantastic. And she actually jogged to her chemo treatment that morning. She didn't even know I was there. So, design does matter because everything about her day had been designed from where to park to what building entrance to use, even the scripts that the staff used at the reception desk. Everything was orchestrated to make her experience that day better. So, when you ask what do I choose to spend my personal time on, 
um, I get excited and uh, passionate about projects that actually make a real difference. Uh, which kind of leads me into my first kind of passion project that I'll touch on briefly, um, which was a reaction to this. Um, there are three basic human needs of food, water, and shelter. Um, and this is how the most powerful country in the world handled shelter after Hurricane Katrina. This is the Astrodome in Houston, post-Katrina. So this is where the people that actually were able to escape New Orleans were shipped off to over 350 miles away from home, and this was their home. These army cots with all their personal belongings in a plastic bag stuffed underneath. Now this absolutely outraged me because there was no sense of privacy, no sense of dignity, no real sense of security, and this is how they had to track down their loved ones with cardboard signs. And as I did more research on this, I found out that over 32 and a half million people every year are displaced just by global disasters, natural disasters. That's not even counting uh, man-made conflicts like the one million currently displaced in Syria. So I decided to design some coffee cups to help this out. And it sounds a little ridiculous, but if you actually think about a coffee cup, it has some great attributes. So if you actually flip a coffee cup upside down, you have essentially an all-in-one design that gives you roof, walls, uh, and a floor. And they stack up really nice to be able to ship these things around very efficiently and store them very efficiently. Plus, they're insulated. Um, so I made some really big coffee cups, um, and I've had them manufactured. Um, we actually store them in an aircraft hangar in Georgetown here uh, for demonstrations. And we've had everybody from FEMA you can imagine to come down and look at them. And this to me seemed like a much more dignified response uh, to disasters than a tent or an army cot out in the middle of an indoor baseball field. But this is pretty far afield from what most people would consider a graphic designer would ever try to design. And it's not just an excuse to get into architecture and industrial design. These things are actually smart. Um, they all have microprocessors embedded into them, so as soon as they're powered up, they start wirelessly relaying their current status back to an entire command center app, um, which actually allows us to eliminate the cardboard signs. You, you know exactly where Uncle Bob is, what unit he's in, and if the temperature is okay in there for him. Um, but outside of kind of selfishly thinking, um, selfishly for me to think about these things beyond just a disaster application, uh, things like ACL. Um, I would love nothing more than to go to ACL and not have to worry with about leaving, just be able to stroll over to a pop-up hotel on site and, and not necessarily worry about fighting crowds or traffic. Because I hate traffic. I don't think anybody here really likes traffic, which leads me into the other passion project that I think everybody really came to hear uh, more about today. Um, so this is Interstate 35 right now in Austin. Um, it's a pretty packed place. Um, and as Ben mentioned, we're one of the fastest growing cities. Every year that I've been here in Austin, we've been in the top five or the fastest growing cities in the U.S. Um, but our current infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure, is already evaluated to be about 20 years behind schedule for our current population. What's really horrifying and frightening is when you think about the next 20 years. For the next 20 years, our population is supposed to double, and we're not even keeping up with it today. Uh, so this poster sits outside of our office uh, here at Frog, Texas. And this shows the very heart of Austin, six in Congress, 100 years ago. And I found this picture to be really fascinating because look at all the number of streetcars or light rail that we had in Austin 100 years ago. This was just the ubiquity of light rail here in Austin was just fascinating to me. So one morning I was actually drinking coffee, uh, looking at this poster, trying to wake up, and this guy walked up. Now, some of you may know Jared. Um, if you don't, um, he's something to behold. Uh, but he usually, he's very well known for some of his rants. Um, and then when we started discussing transportation in front of this poster, he quickly kind of quipped uh, some of his quotable rants of uh, being, why solve a modern problem with a 200-year-old solution? Seriously, why go back to what our great-grandfathers had uh, used for transportation? And his rant kind of concluded, he went on, he's really long-winded, and he went on stories about his ski bum days at ski resorts and whatnot. And I kind of laughed at the idea then of using ski lifts as a form of mass transit. Um, but transportation seemed like a really good problem to solve. So at Frog, we actually found a, a bunch of other frogs uh, that were actually hated traffic as much as I did um, and were willing to work after hours on um, kind of this passion project. Now, to dispel some of the rumors kind of like how the wire actually started, we didn't start out to do something crazy like, let's put ski lifts in as a subway system. Um, it actually started out as design research. So we actually shadowed Cap Metro bus riders and train riders around Austin to see what their experience was like. 
uh, from when they left at home all the way through riding the system. We interviewed people that didn't ride transit to see what they thought. And then we tacked the, the Frog Global Network, all our studios worldwide, to see kind of what their thoughts were on mass transit, how they viewed uh, transit from an um, international perspective. And through all this research, we kind of came up with two conclusions. The first one being, nobody likes schedules. So one of the big aversions or fears with mass transit is essentially having to adhere to a schedule that you didn't create. You're actually asking somebody to change their entire lifestyle around um, a schedule that they have no control over. The other big finding we had was uh, fear of crowding or lack of personal space. Um, if you think about it, when you sit in your car, you sit in there with all your personal belongings and your cup holders and your XM satellite radio, and it's a pretty nice experience. But if you're on public transit at peak times, you have no sense of uh, personal space. You're having to constantly guard um, yourself and your personal belongings against a sea of strangers. So essentially we found that these two fears were why a lot of folks had an aversion to mass transit. There was essentially a cultural disconnect between urban and transit planners with the actual intended users of the system. And there's also a basic logic here uh, where it's a real estate problem. Because see, if you look at their current uh, bandwidth and capacity through a city, um, once this starts reaching max capacity, the first kind of knee-jerk response is, well, let's go in and put in a different mode of transit. But what you're in fact doing is we're displacing capacity or bandwidth with another mode of transit. We're actually displacing lanes of traffic to put in trains. But if we just looked up 15 to 20 feet in the air, there's all this eminent domain that is unused, literally empty airspace that could be utilized. So that's the basic logic or premise behind the wire. Um, and the wire is just our vision for a user-friendly um, practical mass transit system. So ski lifts don't sound that crazy after all. And when you hear ski lifts or gondolas, let's kind of clarify what we're talking about. We're talking about high-speed detachable gondolas. These things are uh, hold one to eight people per car, very similar to your automobile, right? Um, they're attached to a cable, suspended by towers, and they cruise along about 15 miles an hour, which may not sound that fast until we actually researched this using some jogging apps. So we're sorry if we screwed up your morning runs for a while if you're using uh, some of your jogging apps. Uh, but we actually tracked rush hour traffic here in Austin and found it was about average eight miles an hour in town. So this thing actually moves twice as fast as uh, surface-based traffic downtown. Now they're called detachable because as they actually come into a station, they release from the cable and slow down to just above walking speed, allowing you to easily step or roll right on one of these. Then they accelerate back up to line speed and reattach to the cable, but they never stop. The operation is continuous. So what that means, no schedules. So essentially you don't have to adhere to any kind of schedule because these things are essentially a moving sky, a sidewalk or moving skyway. Um, and then, of course, you can have the ability, just like with your car, to pick who rides with you. If you don't like the creepy looking guy that comes through the car, you wait two seconds and catch the next one right behind it. Um, but the detachable part also means that we can actually um, flux and add inventory on demand. So during peak rush hours, we essentially just roll more cars out on the line. Um, and then we take them off in non-peak hours to kind of conserve energy. Um, so you can see what kind of advantage that would have here uh, during our peak uh, times or during special events in Austin, which is a big deal with South by Southwest and ACL. Um, but there's also room for bikes inside of gondolas. There's no specialty bike racks needed. You just roll your bike right in the center, which gives us a whole nother application for uh, mass transit. Instead of just being something that is a circulator or commuter line, we actually now have some, a system uh, that allows cyclists here in Austin just to roll over and hop over the most dangerous parts of the city. Some of the spots that you see ghost bikes at that people don't want to bike through, you roll your bike on over that and we can literally hop over that. But we can also hop over geographic barriers. So one of the big transit problems here in Austin is a river runs through it. We essentially have a geographic barrier that causes most of our traffic bottlenecks here. And the wire goes over that with no additional cost. The cable doesn't care if it's flying over a river, 6th Street, um, or a green belt. It's all the exact same cost. Whereas if you're putting in something else like a surface-based light rail, you're talking about a $90 million new bridge to go across the river, essentially because you can't touch Lamar, it's a historic site. You can't touch Congress Bridge, it's an ecologically sensitive thing with the bats. So you're left with essentially building a new bridge. But the other thing that cable does is it actually provides us some flexibility and really kind of creative routing options because now we can actually go above um, obstacles like uh, the double-decker 35, no need to bury it, we can just fly over it. Um, or we can go under things 
We can go around things. Um, so this gives us some great flexibility with one of the invisible barriers here in Austin, the view corridors. We simply just go around the view cones. It's not that big of an issue. But let's talk about, um, I'm trying to do some more facts and figures given our setting here in City Hall. So let's talk about the four big C's of cost, capacity, connections, and community, which I think all of those are actually really important when it comes to talking about mass transit. So let's start with cost and just get this one out of the way. Um, light rail on average um, usually averages out to be about $100 million a mile. But there's actually a hidden cost when you start thinking about um, surface-based transportation options because literally every foot that you tear up coming through um, to lay something in on the surface, you're actually disrupting local businesses. And you're doing it for an extended amount of time. Uh, but if you look at other options, um, such as uh, urban cable, your disruption's far more limited. We're essentially just coming in and putting in footings for towers. And then you quickly just bolt the system down on top of that. And because you have this reduced infrastructure, you're not having to build miles and miles of hard infrastructure, um, you get to a better price point. Now, conservatively, we, we got to some numbers um, talking to various OEMs, and then we doubled it uh, to be safe. But we can be more conservative than that and double it again and say it's just half as much as light rail. Um, so it's far more economic, and it's far less disruptive on just construction. Now, if we think about capacity, now this is a fun one, so we can talk about a lot of numbers here, because uh, you'll see it kind of mixed around and, and thrown around in a lot of different ways. Uh, but this is the Zillatar ski area in Austria. It currently holds the world's record in lift capacity. So what's really interesting about it is a system of 174 lifts, and they move 3.5 million people every day uphill. Now, if those people didn't ski down the hill, and they actually rode those empty chairs back down, you're looking at 7 million people per day just during business hours. If you actually run that on 24 hours, like most modern transit systems do, such as the New York subway, uh, you would get something like 14 million people per day as capacity on that. Now, that's pretty ridiculous. Um, but to actually put that in context, uh, the New York City subway, on any given day, runs on average about 5.3 million people per day. So there's tremendous capacity with urban cable. So ski lifts actually don't sound that crazy, and capturing that airspace that's unused above streets here in Austin doesn't sound all that um, bizarre or strange. Um, when you start looking at, um, at Urban Cable 2, uh, you can see that uh, you can move about um, 3,000 people per hour in each direction. Um, so together, one line between two stops, you can move 6,000 people per hour. Now, that sounds like a lot of people, but to kind of put that in um, a different context, um, let's talk about if we actually had wire lines in in Austin actually coming down through some of our most congested points and hopping into downtown. Essentially, that would be displacing 4,000 cars per hour between stations. Um, so that's a pretty big um, capacity, and that's a lot of uh, big numbers. Uh, but essentially, when you start thinking about connections, um, you kind of get into a different aspect of this concept. Um, historically, mass transit works really well if you live near the line, and where you're going is near the line. If you don't, it, you're kind of um, out of luck. Now, most cities um, try to do a circulation system downtown, and then there's different commuter lines that kind of feed into that. But there's a whole bunch of areas around town that people want to go, and unless they're on the line, happen to fall on the line, uh, you're kind of left uh, out of luck a little bit. But if you actually start clustering these things together as hubs with something that's really economic to put in and really fast to deploy, we can actually start creating these little nodes, these little hub spider networks around that kind of circulate people around these areas that they want to go. And now we can connect those back to a feeder system. So you actually have a transit system that can be deployed very cost effectively, very rapidly, and allows for organic growth. There's no 20 year transit planning uh, schemes and trying to guess where the population will go, we can actually build for where the population wants to go now. Um, so that sounds like a crazy idea. Why would we actually want to send people where they want to go in Austin? That's, that's unheard of. Um, and then with all the other cost advantages, I mean, we can hop the river five times at no additional cost. There's no barriers to it. But it also lets us address that final mile. So what if you actually had a transit system where you could take your fare, walk right out of the station to a bike rack below, swipe it, unlock a city bike, and actually bike the last, the last mile problem, bike to your final destination? 
And that's only in the densest part of the cities. On, on the fringes of the system, uh, when you start transitioning more to the suburban fabric, uh, why not have car shares? on a more of a Netflix kind of rider subscription model maybe where you pay the, the premium and now you can take your fare and walk right out, swipe it and unlock a car and take it home. Um, so there's lots of flexibilities if we actually rethink the way transit has been done before. But one of the most often overlooked thing is that cultural aspect, the sense of community. Now a lot of people when you start talking about crazy ideas like using ski lifts as mass transit, uh, everyone starts thinking about these crazy elevated stops and how expensive those things would be. Um, but you don't have to do elevated stops. This stuff came from mountainous terrains where it's used to swapping elevations. We can essentially put in very economic surface stops that take up the exact same footprint as a light rail station. You can literally glide down the surface level, glide right across, step on it, and then it takes you right back up in the air. Now there's other possibilities here as well too, right? Given how portable and how compact some of the, uh, the mechanics are for these systems, you can actually integrate them into existing structures like parking garages and have parking rides where maybe you pay $3 to park, but you also get a free ride into downtown. Now that allows for a whole new different concept in mass transit with public-private partnerships that just can't simply be done today. Uh, but since we're actually able to take people where they want to go, you're actually getting uh, this kind of uh, cultural connection with the system. People actually have stations in their neighborhoods actually where they live. They have stations where they want to go. And they take pride in that because you identify with your station. This is, makes a statement about who you are. This is where I live, which brings pride in the overall system. Because the most expensive transit systems out there are the ones that nobody uses. So with good design, this system become an iconic representation for our entire city and actually a force for kind of cultural good locally. But when we go out and talk about this, people often think that we're doing something crazy. It's like, oh, you're inventing anti-gravity. This is, this is unheard of. You want to put people in personal rapid transit vehicles through vacuum tubes and this is, un you can't do any of this. And we were like, really? This exists right now. So some frogs just got back from Medellin, Colombia that actually has a metro cable system. And there's some really unheard of uh, advances and kind of some fringe benefits that came out of that that nobody ever thought of. Simply by having cars go over uh, people's homes, over some uh, really neglected neighborhoods, they actually cleaned up. Because it was simply the fact I can see all your trash when I go over. So all the homes started cleaning up and um, the economy actually came back. Entire neighborhoods that were geographically isolated, like East Austin, actually became uh, uh, much more vibrant neighborhoods where businesses came back and a lot of investments came back. And it has been such a sense of pride and local stewardship there uh, that they're actually expanding it now. They're actually expanding more lines. They currently are running three lines. So this isn't something totally off the wall crazy that's 20 years out or 50 years out or some kind of crazy vision that physicists need to go and study and see if it can be done. It's running right now at your local ski resort. But this is more what you think about when you think about a designer trying to do mass transit. When you think about a sarcastic billboards and, and whatnot. Uh, but design does matter. Being a designer is important. Because as a designer, we actually have the ability to design the world we want to live in. So I think it's up to all of us to design something worthwhile. Thanks. <laughs>